Welcome back, everybody. This is Nicole Naditz, your host for this series of interviews with national leaders in world language education who bring the high leverage teaching practices to life through their experience and expertise. Before we begin today's interview, I want to thank the National Foreign Language Resource Center at the University of Hawaii for their development of this project, which includes these interviews, but also later two webinars and a series of short TED Ed courses. Today, we will examine the fifth high leverage teaching practice, focusing on cultural products, practices, and perspectives in a dialogic context. Much like the fourth HLTP, this one also centers on designing contextualized interactive learning experiences in order to maximize the students' outcomes. But this time, instead of targeting language form, we will, ex we will explore creating contexts for building interculturality. Today's guest is a nationally recognized expert on fostering learners' intercultural proficiency. Dr. Jackie Van Houten is passionate about intercultural communication. In her current job as District World Language Coordinator in Louisville, Kentucky, Jackie guides curriculum development around language proficiency and intercultural competence. When she worked at the Kentucky Department of Education, her state was the first to include intercultural competencies as part of their statewide language standards. She has served on the National Council of State Supervisors, the National Network for Early Language Learners, and in 2015, ACTFL, where she led the task force that developed the Necessful ACTFL can-do statements for intercultural communication. So we really wanna thank you for being here with us today, Jackie. My pleasure. Um, first of all, can you highlight for us why it's important for language teachers to move beyond teaching culture as factoids to memorize and towards starting with culture and integrating culture throughout the learning cycle? Sure. Um, I think that we've um, all realized that just teaching and learning facts is not enough. Um, if we really want to take our learners to and prepare them to become global citizens, um, to interact interculturally with intercultural competence, then we have to go deeper than that. Um, technology has afforded us great opportunities to um, access all kinds of authentic documents and sources. Um, you can look at interactive mapping for, uh, for geography or for the environment. You can use social media to connect with people. Um, you know, there, you could take virtual tours of towns and museums. Um, and also think of the opportunities that our learners have today to interact with their peers or with others who speak the language, not just through technology or travel, but even in their own communities, um, in their own neighborhoods. So learning cultural facts isn't going to be enough to prepare them for that interaction. Um, if they want to function with the language and with cultural knowledge in and among cultures, then, then they need to know more than just facts. Um, this includes discovering their own cultures too, thinking about what makes culture for them. And so I think that it's important for us to move beyond that and integrate culture in every aspect of language learning. The simplest way to do this, of course, is in the classroom, is for teachers to start with um, a theme or a problem or an issue that's contextualized in real life and that, recognize that recognizes that every situation is cultural. And then beyond that, to set learning goals that would be the necessful, actful, can-do statements for interculturality supported by language goals. Absolutely. And in fact, the authors note that culture isn't just a combination of practices, products, and perspectives that make up this body of knowledge. But as they say, it's a dynamic system of beliefs, values, and worldviews that emerge in and are shaped by um, the shared social practices and products of a group or group of individuals. And so I was wondering, how does this view of culture shape and inform the work of world language educators? Mm -hmm. Well, the authors are right in pointing out that dynamic nature um, of, and system of culture. Um, there's always been uh, an evolution of society's beliefs and values, but globalization has speeded things up and speeded it up to the point where 
there's a lot of frequent interaction among people from different cultures. And so you can't say there's a constant in culture. You can't say something like, well, the French have croissants for breakfast and drink wine for dinner. I mean, that, that just is not going to be the case. Um, it's an overgeneralization. And also there are plenty of people who have experienced the croissant and, and wine culture and have brought it into their own. So there's a, a blending of cultures now. So it's not, it's not simple to say, you know, that, that we have just a static culture. Everything is fluid. Um, and not everyone in the same country shares that same practice. So when we're thinking about our, our own country and our own culture, we have to realize that our next door neighbors, people in our family, do not have the same practices as we do. There's, there's a difference all the way around. What this means for the teacher is that we have a responsibility to avoid restricting our students' exposure to prescribed elements of culture that would create or even add to existing stereotypes or that wouldn't take them beyond that tourist view, which is a pretty negative view. Um, it, we really have to provide them opportunities, opportunities to investigate authentic culture, um, to experience it, to interpret it, to analyze it, and most importantly, to reflect on it. Um, for instance, encouraging learners to compare artistic expression in, in music videos that they watch with how others do in their target culture, um, to look at Facebook pages, to gauge people's interests and in how they are alike and how they're different, um, compare department store online ads for products and marketing strategies. Um, you know, a variety of different ways, but, but we have to give them lots of exposure and lots of opportunities to interact. Yeah, I really like how you brought up all those different kinds of authentic products and how each of those brings a different lens with it. It's not just the language that we see there, but every product is shaped and designed specifically for its target culture audience. Mm -hmm. And so we have to learn to look beyond just the obvious to see what it's telling us. What are the messages? Right. Um, so with that, learning the values and perspectives of those whose cultural upbringing differs from one's own challenges long held assumptions that one may have about a cultural group. And the process of breaking down those assumptions and stereotypes includes an initial period of resistance by learners. And the authors note that these initial negative reactions are actually the first stage in developing cultural understanding. So can you tell us a little bit about why is this first stage important? And then what kinds of experiences are integral to helping learners move past those negative feelings that they might start with? Sure, because um, going through that negative phase in the development of cultural awareness to intercultural competence is a natural one that's been explored by lots of psychologists and sociologists. Um, Milton Bennett, for example, talks about going through the stages of, of denial, of being defensive, um, of minimizing the differences to protect your own identity. And, and when learners are first learning about another culture that is different than theirs, they are protective of their own and they need to be comfortable with that. They need to understand their own culture before they can go beyond to being aware of the other's culture and then being respectful of and, and mediating between cultures. Um, so, so we, we need to, to think about the viewpoints that we're portraying. We, we need to help our learners begin to know the other, um, to interpret, um, and to interpret from a critical perspective, and then eventually to come to that critical awareness of culture in our everyday lives. And we can help our learners do this and go beyond that initial stage by, um, by thinking not so much of what is weird, but by giving them opportunities to see difference, to make comparisons, um, to then understand why something is happening and to reflect on that. And for that, you, you want to have authentic investigation. You want to have opportunities for them to read blogs, to listen to podcasts, to, um, to look at uh, statistics of a country, to um, look at how cultural events are portrayed. Um, and then interactions, maybe with interviewing English language learners that are in their own school first, before they go beyond to work with a partner school in another country, um, or to get information by sharing it through social media, where, where there's always you know, that potential of misinterpreting. Um, and then most importantly, they have to reflect on those um, experiences. But for the experiences to be 
meaningful to them, they have to be comprehensible. So we have to be careful when we're producing the tasks in our lessons so that they don't revert back to English because the task is too complicated. Or we have to make sure that we have done enough comprehensible input strategies so that learners can understand the language that we're using. Um, and, and that ensures the, the understanding, not just of the language, but of the context and the culture we're trying to get to. In fact, we're going to dive a little bit deeper into that because um, the, one of the questions I think you and I both always get when we're out talking to teachers is, yes, but what about our novice learners? Mm -hmm. um, so what kinds of cultural experiences can teachers successfully facilitate with novice learners that will deepen their cultural knowledge and support them to discuss the relationship between perspectives and cultural products and practices in the target language. Target language, yeah. Well, novice learners are generally just beginning to identify those products and practices um, of culture. So you have to start with what's familiar. Um, and again, that helps you get to know your own, but not just to get to know your own culture, to, but to realize that even in their own circles, there are differences and then broaden out while all the while sort of pondering why, you know, why do I do what I do? Why does my neighbor do what she or he does? And then why does the other in the other culture do what they do? So when, when exploring, for example, uh, what and how people celebrate, um, Vocabulary could be introduced through images of maybe national holidays um, and why we celebrate them differently. Um, we could guide our learners to understand that our own families and friends uh, may not celebrate in the same manner. Um, teachers could guide learners to, to this conclusion that they, not everybody is the same by asking comprehensible input questions that are simple at first, just yes, no, either, or, building up. Um, and then they could reintroduce the vocabulary with images from the target culture. Um, images that suggest that the target culture people also don't celebrate all the same way. So uh, you, again, you dispel that stereotype. Um, and then maybe at home, you can provide some prompts for learners to answer questions about the whys in their own language, in their native language. And here they get to the really deep thinking that they're sometimes frustrated with when they're in the classroom because they don't have enough language to, to be able to express it. And you don't want them to slip out of the target language. So introducing that question in class and then taking it home for deep thought uh, in English and then bringing it back through some image or through some activities the next day in class is, is what I think helps with this. Um, but no matter what the content is, that language is always going to be integral to the culture and vice versa. You just cannot separate them. So when we, for instance, learn about families, um, we might want to show images of target culture um, athletes' families or singers' families or famous politicians or royal families or somebody historical. When we talk about how people eat, we might want to use food plates from a variety of countries, um, show infographics about food waste, um, talk about uh, school menus uh, at various, the, the cafeteria menus. Um, we want to give kids an opportunity to explore food banks, you know, or online food buying at grocery stores that, that deliver food. Um, we want to just give them all kinds of experiences and opportunities so they can see that everybody is not the same, everybody is not different, but everybody has a culture. I think you brought up that point came up a couple of times in your last response, the importance of providing students with multiple opportunities to witness and talk about and discuss and learn about a variety of cultural perspectives. Um, sometimes, as you said, it was through bringing different images over the course of a series of lessons that, you know, provide another perspective. Sometimes it's by, as you said, kind of challenging the notion that, you know, science is the same everywhere. The healthy food diagram looks the same everywhere as it does here, right? And actually it doesn't um, and so on. So I really, really appreciate that. Um, the authors stress that all language instruction must be embedded in cultural contexts. And I know from your work that you definitely agree with that. What are some key strategies that educators can use to make that a reality in their programs? Well, I would say that the first strategy, the, the big strategy, is to frame the curricula, curriculum around um, a real world cultural context, whether it's um, you know, a problem or an issue or a theme, you, you want to look at what you want your learners to learn 
as a problem for them to solve. And that way they'll be able to communicate with knowledge uh, and language and they'll see the importance of it because they're using it to solve a problem. They're using it for a real world purpose. Um, then I would link it to the standards. And linking to the standards means not just the communication and cultures and the other standards, but to the deconstructions through the can-do statements. Starting with the can-do statements that are the intercultural communication ones, because that gives you the context. And then from that, finding out what kind of language can-dos um, students will, will need to have as goals so that they can support that contextual um, theme or problem. Uh, and, and I would say to teachers, don't be afraid of letting go of the textbook. You know, create a, a unit around a theme, create a semester around a problem, um, but make it real world and bring your learners in. Create some essential questions that, that are, they have meaning to the students. Give them some voice and choice in, in what you're looking at. Um, that piques their interest and goes, helps them go into investigation of culture and maybe suggest some ways that they can interact that they hadn't thought about before. Um, and with every concept, that's introduced, use authentic materials, um, images, voices, text, whatever, to make the new language comprehensible. So you, you could, if you have a friend who is um, in the target country, ask that friend to take their, uh, use FaceTime or, or Skype and go around the house, show them what the house looks like, introduce them to their family. Um, Arrange for your students to interview those English language learners and see what their preferences are, how their lifestyle has changed, what they do now in America, what they used to do in the target culture. Um, have students take a week to explore something and that they're absolutely passionate about that relates to the culture. That builds that motivation. And then connect your lessons with to local and, and statewide nonprofits, um, businesses, agencies that are, have an international bent toward your culture. And you could go on and on with ways to do this, but you have to be creative sometimes. Yeah, absolutely. And sometimes it means that things won't look the same from year to year to year, because when you're driven by students' interests and or driven by things that are happening in the cultures around the world that suddenly bring new authentic resources mm -hmm. along with their perspectives and values to life then we we adapt to that and, and i think it's hard for some teachers too mm -hmm. um it's, it's easier for teachers who are a little bit more flexible and and don't have to stick to a plan um but for others it, it's a challenge it's it even seems scarier to some teachers like when you mentioned don't be afraid to let go of the textbook mm -hmm. but in reality if we really thought the textbook would teach we could just give them the book and go home <laughs> right <laughs> that because we know that that's not going to work so yeah. we it, deep down inside i think we all know that the textbook is is a resource to pick and choose from when appropriate but we have to craft the learning experiences that's right that's right um and you, you touched on authentic materials a couple of times today, including in this last response. And I want to hone in on a specific type of authentic material. Um, can you share some examples of powerful ways to use images, which could include artifacts, photos, videos, or anything that's a visual representation um, to allow students to deepen their cultural knowledge by making observations in the target language? Yeah, well, simple, I think, local photos taken of things like billboards or grocery store shelves um, or children on the playground um, shown alongside similar images from the target culture can be used for learners to describe what they see, but then they probe for what they don't see and they probe for why why things are the way they are. Um, you know, it's, it's easy to use them for vocabulary, but you can go way beyond that. And I don't think we sometimes take advantage of that. Um, I'd suggest as a few resources using uh, Peter Menzel's book on um, Hungry Planet, which gives you plenty of, of pictures of how people, the groceries that people buy for a week in various cultures. Um, James Mollison's website has images of, of children's bedrooms around the world, same type of thing. Um, and then I think too, if you <clears throat> have the opportunity to work with a partner class and you Skype with them, maybe it's a one-time thing, maybe it's irregular. I find the best use of that is to archive it and re-watch it 
watch it again the day or the week after and look for things that you were too nervous to notice before. You know, how do people sit? Where do they sit? How's the classroom decorated? What are people wearing? How do people react to one another? How do the kids react to the teacher? Um, you know, what do the what do the physical does the physical layout look like um, compared to yours? But what do what are the reactions that people are having? And how did you feel when you used language? <clears throat> Notice how they feel when they're talking. Are they embarrassed? Are they laughing at mistakes they make? Are they laughing at something you said and maybe you're embarrassed? But you know why? And then take that home and reflect on it. If we if we think about how and why we're using language and we anticipate what can happen in the next go round with that Skype call, with that interaction, then we're prepared and we're more likely to be um, sympathetic toward others and, and less tense among our own selves. Um, this whole process, I think, is, um, is really one of noticing and comparing and reflecting. It's cyclical. But you know, you you go through it every time. You you look at something, but you then really notice it. You compare with your own, and you analyze, and you get to the point where you reflect on the interculturality of it. Um, the authors refer to this. They have their own process, and they give some pretty good templates too, um, with the model, uh, the image model, uh, I M A G E. Yeah, we're going to talk about that in a little bit, actually. At mm -hmm. least, uh, yeah, it comes up a little bit later. Um, so. The, um, in recent years, we've actually seen a shift in how we talk about culture in the context of language learning. Um, now we see more and more frequently the term interculturality and also intercultural proficiency or sometimes intercultural competence. Can you briefly explain for our listeners what we mean by interculturality and how that differs from the way we used to talk about teaching and learning culture? before we used this term. Mm -hmm. Sure, um, interculturality, it, it, when you're talking about communication, intercultural communication, is, is using the skill of the language, the expression, with the knowledge of the culture. And if you go with um, Michael Byram's uh, theories on interculturality, it's really going through stages of knowing. Of, of being aware of noticing things that are around you, of knowing what makes up culture, of knowing your culture, of beginning a little of a critical eye toward culture and beginning to make comparisons and, and ask questions of why, and then getting to a point where you, you empathize the other. And then you can actually mediate between, and I, I kind of liken it to, the first time that I spent any length of time in France, actually the first time I went to France was for a year, uh, in my junior year. And when I went over there the first time, I tended at first to be very defensive. You know, I, this is different. This is not American. I notice those differences. And then after a period of time, Everything was wonderful. I loved everything that was French. It was perfect. And what, what, what I knew before wasn't as good. And then you come to sort of a realization that there is good and bad to both places. And you come to that center spot, to that other spot where you can really understand what the other is thinking, why they're doing things. You start to understand why you're doing things and you mediate between them. So I, th I think that's that interculturality that we're looking for. And when we go for it in the classroom, the proficiency plays a big part because you may know a whole lot about culture and how people react in culture, but if you can't express it in the language and you can't actually notice the culture in the language, then you're not really acting interculturally. You're not communicating interculturally and vice versa. You can know the language to a T, have all that grammar and vocabulary down, but if you don't understand the culture, again, you can't act interculturally. Yeah, I used to, I often tell teachers that you can know every word in the language and still fail to communicate effectively due to an inability to navigate within and among cultures. And that, in fact, Google Translate does know every word in the language, and that's part of where some of the breakdowns occur when they do, because it can't do those exact things. Right. Um, so 
we referenced, we started talking a bit about images earlier and that, that first part of the model where you, you have the image and the students start making observations about the image. And you talked a lot about the importance of that cyclical nature of, of making observations, noticing things, comparing them and reflecting on what they're noticing. And once the students have made and debriefed their initial observations about an image, the authors propose three more steps to foster interculturality using images, um, analyzing additional information, generating hypotheses about cultural perspectives, and then exploring the perspectives and, as you said, reflecting further, all in the target language. So what kinds of additional information would you recommend that students analyze for one of the image examples you cited earlier, like if you just broke down one image that you talked about? Well, let's take that. Um that photo of a week's worth of groceries. So students could examine then the country's food plates or the food pyramids. They could look at data around the national average income, around poverty rates, around obesity rates. They could look at the agricultural um, production of the country, um, talk about the food imports and exports. And then they could read short text that might come something about family meal times or about how teens' um, eating habits are changing over time. And then from this data, they could um, hypothesize about the effects of natural resources on the, on the national diet. Um, they could look at uh, the influence of family incomes on the food that's bought. Um, they could look at health trends, you know, could hypothesize about how health is affected by all of this. And then something a little bit more personal, they could actually hypothesize how a, a student would react coming from that country um, to their own home. You know, what would they find? What, how would they feel? What would they maybe like and dislike about the food that you would serve them? Yeah, those are all really powerful ideas. And what they highlight is that need to create a larger context within which language occurs and and really build in students that ongoing capacity to always kind of be open and, and observing and on the lookout and ready to use what they're seeing, ready to talk about it, share it, and analyze it. Mm -hmm. um, for exploring and reflecting, the authors state that a different second set of images is necessary. And I, you referred to this a little bit earlier as well. Why is this important and what second set of images would you recommend to um, using for that first image, for example, to foster students' ability to develop even greater cultural proficiency? Mm -hmm. Well, just using that one image alone has the potential for uh, generalizing and stereotyping. So you want to provide them a variety of images so that they can get a broader view. Um, it, it, pro providing those will also maybe provoke some questions that they have. Um, you know, you don't even have to ask the questions. They're going to notice that somebody doesn't do something the way someone else does, and why is that? Um, so showing photos maybe of, of the family meal times, of uh, authentic grocery ads, um, of school cafeteria weekly menus, you know, comparing what you, what you eat and what they eat, um, looking at a, a cooking video. Um, we have a lot of cooking shows on TV, so why not look at one from the target culture? Um, they can all provide a broader view of the culture. And the more they see, then the more they have to reflect on and the, and the broader view they can develop. Um, traditionally, publisher materials in the past at least have presented cultural factoids, and then they include assessment questions about those factoids that have distinct right or wrong answers. What risks does such an approach pose and what do you recommend doing differently? Yeah, well, the question you pose actually goes deeper than just um, the right or wrong answer in the textbook. Um, but let's start with that one. And, um, you know, by merely teaching facts or factoids, we kind of ignore the fluidity of culture. Um, we, we have a tendency if we're teaching a fact to stop it there and that allows for a stereotype to form. Um, or worse, we can dis disenfranchise certain groups that, that aren't mentioned um, or that are, are not represented at all. Um, when learning, a, leading a culture 
explanation to a textbook. Uh, you have maybe a, a paragraph, you've got a picture, you know, you've got something that gives you an image. You have to think about how that limits the learner's view. Um, and that it could possibly stifle their curiosity. Um, it, could, it could curb motivation because what they're looking at may not have meaning to them. So you want to try to give them a variety of things that relate to them and let them explore to find images that are powerful for them. This isn't to say that facts um, aren't important, that certain facts don't have to be learned. Certainly we want to present facts, but you have to recognize that facts, the presentation of facts can be manipulated to present a stereotype. And the teachers have a responsibility to build learners' ability to critically analyze, um, to, to view with a critical mind what they're looking at, to interpret something uh, with a broader understanding of what that means in the culture. You know, you have to be really critical about these things. And that takes us back to what Michael Byram says about becoming intercultural, developing the intercultural mindset, that you need to be able to critically analyze and look at both sides if you're going to develop uh, an understanding of perspectives. Those are really outstanding points, all the way from the, you know, making sure we, pers we provide the fluidity of culture, we don't limit or exclude, and recognizing that textbooks are a commercial product. Mm -hmm. And there is a purpose to that that it provides just one lens, so we don't ever want to limit what we're doing to that one lens. And, um, and I don't want to uh, negate textbooks too much. I know that a lot of authors and publishers are trying very hard to look at things through an intercultural lens. So, but, but they are limited just in the number of pages that they have and the images they can portray. Right. I mean, it's costly for, you know, for them to, they can't provide everything. And, mm -hmm. and so again, as teachers, we're bound to consider the, what we can use and pull from a book that we are, we have adopted mm -hmm. and how we can then go further. Mm -hmm. Right. It's, it might be a starting point, but we then have, as you said much earlier, we can bring technology to bear to help take that further and provide additional lenses, additional opportunities. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, finally, can you elaborate briefly on the role of interculturality in empowering student agency in their own communities and around the world? And that's what it's all about, isn't it? It's becoming intercultural so that you can interact with others and you can mediate those situations. Um, but becoming intercultural is a process, and it's a process for all of us, for teachers, for learners, for all of us. Um, for our learners, the more that they can become aware of their own culture, how they form and how they express their perspectives through language and behaviors, then the more aware and understanding they'll be of others perspectives. Um, in our job as teachers, we should be providing them those opportunities to use the language and the cultural knowledge for authentic purposes and to have them reflect on that. If we don't give them the opportunities, they'll never get to the reflection piece. And that's a crucial piece. Um, it can be extremely empowering for young learners to use their language and language skills and their intercultural competencies in real situations. Um, collaborating on a project with those English language learners or with a partner class, working with local immigrant communities or producing something that can be helpful to them, um, volunteering at local or state international events where they might meet and greet and, you know, perhaps develop relationships with people, um, participating in sister cities, uh, World Affairs Council, Amnesty International, a variety of, of nonprofits um, and volunteer agencies. This is how relationships are formed and it's how difference is mediated. What better way could we be preparing our learners to be global citizens and, and you know, to act in the future with, uh, with intercultural competence and providing these opportunities. Right. I mean, isn't that what we are all about as language educators is preparing our learners to go out way beyond our rooms and interact with people in their own communities and around the world in ways that demonstrate both their linguistic proficiency that continues to grow as well as that intercultural understanding. That's right. what we're here for. Um, I want to thank you so much, Jackie, for your work in this area and especially for taking the time to give us this personalized um, introduction today.
it was it was a really it was a pleasure having you here with us today. Well, it's always a delight to talk with you and to share information about interculturality. Right, it's what we love to do. Um, our next interview uh, will be with 2007 Actful National Language Teacher of the Year, Christine Lanfear, and we will be focusing on HLTP six, providing oral corrective feedback to improve learner performance. So, thanks everyone for joining us today, and have a great day. Bye bye. <laughs>